Hello? Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, good. Very good. Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm recovering from a friend's wedding yesterday, which naturally <laughs> enough, uh, you can imagine the consequences of uh, those celebrations. But um, yeah, no, otherwise, very good. Very good. Yeah. What about you? Well, I feel your pain. I uh, had a bit of a revelry yesterday. And uh, ended up getting thrown out. Oh, good. Of uh, Pompeii. Is this um, a local highbrow establishment, I take it, or is this. No, know, it's the actual Pompeii. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I, of course, am an innocent victim. And, uh, well, frankly, I found Pompeii pretty redundant. So, fuck them. Okay. Is this, well, is this, is that the actual museum or I have no idea what's there. You know, okay, this is the, you were touring the remains while under the influence, I take it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and well, I, any number of comic possibilities here, you might have added to some of the illustrations or, your move to enact some of that which you saw. Uh, I think they would have charged me if I'd done anything that ambitious. Okay. Well, the way the story breaks down basically is this. I got up quite early yesterday morning in order to travel to Pompeii, and I thought maybe Vesuvius as well. And, uh, of course, none of the buses around here are on time, so I ended up walking 45 minutes to get to a train station where I was on a train for about an hour to uh, get to Naples, where I boarded another train for about 45 minutes in order to get to Pompeii. Pompeii is a big site. It's basically the skeletal remains of a town. Mm -hmm. And it's the size of a small town. But uh, having had a long journey already, and it being a sunny, fine day, um, you know, when you get off the train there, there's... A cafe, there's a whole set of cafes, but I stopped at a cafe bar and I thought, well, why not a little something for strength, you know? I suppose it's also true that uh, in my possession at the same time was a pint-sized bottle of whiskey, which I figured would also sustain me. But I might have had a little too much at the cafe or the combination, I don't know, in any case. So once inside the site, I can only reconstruct what happened, and that is... Um, I was being observed on account of the fact that I kept pulling out this pint bottle and ostentatiously taking swigs. <laughs> 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 As if to suggest to the fellow tourists, you know, here's something better that you ought to be doing. And, um, of course, I was too daft at the time to really notice. I mean, I kind of do, but at the same time, you don't really... Um, you, you were... Uh drunkenly discreet, which is uh, blistering, <laughs> blisteringly obvious to everybody else. That, yeah. yeah. And of course, even though you might know here and there that somebody's taking a close look at you, you're, you're too drunk and too stupid to realize that at any given moment, there might be half a dozen people watching you all at the same time. Of course, yeah. So I'm stumbling around the ruins, and um, I think that contributed. You know, the, the streets are all original streets. <laughs> And they're made of these giant cobblestones. I guess they're cobblestones. I guess that's the term, but they're huge and they're irregular. So you're constantly stumbling already. Yeah. To be drunk on top of it sort of adds insult to injury. Oh, I was imagining it might have balanced itself out. You know, you found <laughs> that <laughs> unique uh, stability. Uh, between well, both. maybe I got off on the wrong foot. You could be right. So if I had taken the first step into the town with the other foot, maybe. Yeah. The, Swaying would have synchronized with the cobbles, but no, it was the opposite effect. It was like exactly the opposite of what I needed. So this went on, and I, you know, it was a beautiful day, hot sun. And today, of course, I'm totally sunburned, but, you know, I was walking around and thought I was doing all right. And um, at some point, I really had to take a piss. And, you know, they don't really have toilets on every street corner in Pompeii. So I wandered off into what I thought was an alley, 
you know, like a deserted non archaeological <laughs> alley. And it, of course, it turned out to be a house. So at that point, I was rather rudely apprehended. And again, I had been being observed without really realizing because I thought I was lost in the town. And then, uh, but you know, these tour guides, these people, they're not tour guides, but the employees of the site, they're just a bunch of kids. So yeah. they put on a big show and I was like, fuck this, I'm not going to sit around with this. So I was kind of obliging, but at the first opportunity, I took a run for it, ran off deeper into the town. And then I found this beautiful pathway. I don't know where it is on the map, but I suspect you're not really allowed in there because it was behind the big metal iron door, but the door Which, was open. No, the door was actually open. <laughs> so the door was wide I open. You, I thought you were going to say, I suspected it was open to the public because I had to climb <laughs> over it. <laughs> <laughs> not, that, not that glamorous, I'm afraid. There was a door and it was wide open, but everyone else, all the other tourists around, sort of, they were studiously avoiding it. And I, I discerned in my drunken condition that because they were sober, they were picking up on the cues that I could not. But then I decided that if those cues don't exist for me, then they don't exist. So I decided to go through the door. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm it's sure. It's a beautiful, long, shady path that kind of just like uh, went all the way across the site. And it was behind some sort of high wall. So there was, you know, it was like cool. Uh, there were trees. It was shady. It was beautiful. Most beautiful thing in Pompeii, I think. And yet, of course, it's not open to the public, probably. So I traversed this, ended up on the other side. And in my state, I decided somehow that so much time had passed that I was no longer being a person. Uh, no one was interested in me anymore. And probably the amount of time was no more than 10 or 15 minutes. But you know, in that condition, you think hours have passed, days, and then everyone's moved <laughs> on. You know. <laughs> generations of children have been raised exactly you know so you you're free from harm well of course i wasn't i came close to some sort of other exit it wasn't the one that i went in it wasn't the entrance i came into the site with there was another exit and stupidly i kind of walked up close to it i don't know if i was going to look at the map or what but these a completely different set of asshole basically pulled me out through the exit and then wouldn't let me back in yeah. Well, I said, you've got to be fucking kidding me. And I you know, <laughs> showed them the ticket, and they weren't interested in the ticket because I thought maybe I had done some other, other misdeed. But, you know, with these tickets, you're technically allowed full-day access, not only to Pompeii, but there's another site, uh, the Herculaneum or whatever it's called. I didn't go there. But, um, oh, I mean, um, totally victimized. Victimized. <laughs> I, I sound um it was good. It sounded like you had a good day. Um, well, I went to Vesuvius after that, truth be told. And I uh, tried to piss into the crater because all oh, this is a giant gravel pit. Yeah. And you, uh, oh, it's an ordeal. You have to take a uh, trolley to a van. And it takes like an hour to get to the top of this thing. And then you've got about an hour to walk around and return. And at some point, I thought I was in a completely deserted part. Of, it's a national park, basically. Yeah. And you, there's a path, that, it's a dirt path that goes around the crater. And I thought I was alone. Decided it wouldn't be funny to piss into the volcano. So I prepare to do that, and I extract what I need. And the next thing I know, it's like this Japanese old woman looking at me with her mouth open like she's going to scream. <laughs> You gotta be shitting me. I mean, I can't even piss into a volcano without people being up yeah. in arms. So, you know, I put it away and kind of make a hasty exit. But uh, the rest of the day was unavailable. Oh, I should say, although it's totally unrelated, during my trip back into Naples, I was sitting across from the most beautiful woman. And I really hate that. There's nothing that makes me more upset than beauty. And I don't know how it works for you, but. Every now and then you'll see a woman who's beautiful. And I don't mean similar to a supermodel or anything mm -hmm. like that. You see a woman who's like fully formed. That's the only way I can describe it. She just like her body is totally perfectly fully formed. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody else might just say, oh, she's attractive. She's not bad looking. But 
if you have an eye for that kind of perfection, I find it enormously painful. So I was sitting across from her the whole time and uh, trying not to look at her. Because what am I going to do? I mean, she probably didn't speak English. I think she was actually Spanish, and she was with some stupid friend, of course, who was Italian. And if you're, you know, some creepy asshole like me, you've got no chance to hit on a girl if the friend is there supervising. So, uh, say you're particularly given that you're charmed by this stage was, I assume, particularly alcoholically enhanced. So, uh, <laughs> well, not, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, I, but I rather I'm think sure. that. Yeah. I'm not sure about the curious women of southern Italy, but here in Australia, you know, women tend not to like that at uh, four or five in the afternoon being hit upon by guys who are fucking steam. <laughs> well, there's that. There's that. Yeah. That probably entered into my thinking. But, you know, at that point, many hours had passed, and I was more tired than anything, so I just sat there slumped over. I don't think I had displayed any behaviors that betrayed the fact that I was wasted. But, no, I've encountered women like this sober, and they always fit this very special group. There's only, you know, you can count them on one hand that you see in your lifetime. Mm, you're right. Yeah, oh, it's just so, it's enormously painful to encounter that. Well, whatever, so that's it. I eventually made my way home and, uh, you know, I'm covered from head to toe with a pretty bad sunburn and uh, I'm pretty exhausted. But that's that. Well, you know, it's, it's apropos nothing at all, but it's, I'm sure you've come across, there's, I think there's been something of a, an ongoing discussion of the link between ethnicity and intelligence. And in this debate, it's largely been, I think it's fair to say, sort of repressed because you have strong advocates of what's, what I think it's not called strong uh, race intelligence theory. I think there's a very strong correlation between an ethnicity and overall IQ, and this is given away to sort of present now in the field is, is a weak race iq link but alongside that then um I'm, it seems to be a lot of work it was what i came across was done by ron uns um and he basically argues to my mind quite persuasively for this i have a right this epigenetic effect that's ongoing is a genetic change can occur a lot faster than uh, it's been previously allowed. So over generations, you do see this change in baseline IQ for certain groups. And in that context, he talks quite uh, persuasively, say, of comparing Dutch American and British American average IQs against that for, say, Italian Americans and other, and some Slavic Americans. And it compares that then with Dutch and British IQs with Southern Italian and Slavic IQ. Long story short, is the sort of intense physical environments or the intense, highly uh, stimulating urban environments, which you find where uh, Italian and Slavic Americans are concentrated, are more conducive to cognitive development, which the cognitive development, which seems uh, that can be genetically passed on within generations. Um, well, those environments explain this sort of inversion of the IQ status or the IQ IQs you find of, of European peoples. And this is, you know, and but alongside that, I thought, you know, this is probably true also for physicality. I'd, um, you know, just even physique and looks and aesthetic. One thing I noticed was um, a former girlfriend of mine yeah, is an Afrikaner. She's white South African. And I remember once she she showed me her yearbook from her school, and these were some of the coarsest looking European peoples I've ever laid eyes on. <laughs> um, and and it and it was it was something I joked about at the time. And she she is a keen eye for design and form. She noted the same. She said that you know you see these Dutch. South Africans of Dutch extraction, they, they have this sort of low forehead, huge jaw lines, um, big physical build. Um, 
you, know, you can see this is 15 and 16 year olds. I've never seen a set of 15 and 16 year olds like this. And it, this is this is a sort of demographic I'm used to looking at every day. But equally, you know, alongside that is you have, I think, human physical is still, at least you see in women, it's just taking generation on generation, is 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 improving remarkably. You know, you, you do now, I've, I know what you mean, you see some women and there is something, they obviously represent like a perfect expression of their own inherent genetic potential. You just, I, I've been left breathless by some women I've seen. You know, I went, to, I went to university with a woman here in Australia. She fell into that category. Absolutely, physical perfection, stunningly beautiful. Um, and again, you know, this even ties in with something strange is that this is also noted too that people, when people contact these human looking extraterrestrials, one thing they always say is they're enormously attractive, physically attractive. You know, you, you don't find, um, oh, well, they're the commander of the UFO. He was a sort of ordinary looking guy with a you know, big broken nose or something. It's, they're always these very attractive beings. And you, you know, you have to wonder what is, you know, why would this come about? And you can see these changes in European populations. And it's, it's just, uh, for me, it's a very interesting observation. It's one in a set of observations you find that's obviously got play a part in any reasonable political consideration, but it's one that's just largely denied. It doesn't get much luck in it, in our thinking. The political discourse today, and by that I mean all discourse, because today it seems that all discourse is politicized. It's not capable of handling the question of genetics in anything less than a political or politicized way. And the you can look at the ways that it currently handles the genetic question and the way that it studiously avoids others. Mm. You know, the um, It's willing to talk about genetics a great deal if it means selling pharmaceuticals. So, you know, if uh, your mother's run over by a school bus and you're naturally sad afterward well that's depression and that has a genetic basis and genetic means something you can't control and therefore it's uh something that can only be addressed using pharmaceuticals so buy the pills so in that regard you know genetics is fair game when it comes to anything like uh, correlations between race quote unquote and um intelligence genetics and intelligence you know it's um something that they don't even want to touch it's radioactive and when they do it's never in a way that's inconsistent with sort of the prevailing political paradigm of discourse. So you're stuck with it that way. I mean, the whole category of genetics and the relation between the physical and the mental is at such a rudimentary stage at the moment that it seems there's very little to say. But as to your point regarding the change or the generational changes that take place in human beings, I mean, I would agree if you look at, you know, photographs of women from the 20s, it's a very different type. And you might say that, well, we regard some of these women from our generation as being more physically perfect because our tastes are part and parcel of the generation. So it's circular. Well, that could be. It's hard to say. But um, there is a way to put a profoundly negative spin on all this which is what I'm always inclined to, and that is to say that this sort of flourishing of physical attractiveness that we see in our civilization can be put down to all sorts of uh, terrible things. For example, the triumph of international capital, the fact that you've got these fashion uh, uh, magazines and television constantly promoting uh, physical beauty and so on means that um, women are cultivated in a way more strongly than ever before. Another interpretation you, you can give would be to say, well, physical attractiveness has a physiological basis, and that is the, um, the capture of a mate, to you know, draw the interest of a mate. So why is it so profoundly necessary all of a sudden for women to become so beautiful? Why is it becoming almost desperate? Why, why, is, why is it that as a species we have this need for physical attractiveness? Well, you could say on the one hand, fertility rates are dropping, so therefore the species is in trouble. On the other hand, it could be some pure intimation of doom. 
you because mm. the species knows that it's on its way out. So you're having this orgy of um, basically sex in the culture everywhere you possibly can find it. You know, the rats are on the sh- sinking ship. And what do they do? They screw like mad. And so mm. this increase in relative physical attractiveness could be put down to that. Well, there's a great line. Uh, I think it was Christopher Isherwood. He once wrote, well, I think it was when he was in Berlin, he said he could tell by the alert looks of the girls in the streets that a war was on its way. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, they're wild, you know. It is one of these things that it's difficult to know, but in, in terms of intimations of the future, you know, I didn't I did mention in the email, I thought, well, you know, it's just worth mentioning for a number of reasons. In, I, I I don't know, we've gone over this before, but like you, I, like many people, I have a sense of the future, which is not uh, rosy. And, but alongside that, I have a very strong compulsion towards really med- meditating as much as possible and pursuing a, a path of self-development as hard and as rapidly as I can. This fundamentally involves meditation, you know, proper and careful diet, physical exercise and the like, all with the view of, of really entering and sustaining particular states of consciousness, or at least heightening my overall level of awareness. I'm doing this, I've been engaged in uh, spiritual practice for about eight or nine years now on a daily basis, and intermittently before that. But in the last while, I have made a very deliberate effort to ramp it up as much as possible to really meditate as much as i physically can given my work obligations and last week i had an, an interesting experience well, a couple of weeks ago I had an interesting experience where it followed on from a particularly difficult week at work and in this in this week i had i think i'd averaged maybe but two, two and a half hours meditation each day. Um, and then my plan had been not to have any alcohol until Saturday because alcohol is most deleterious to this effort in, in ways obvious and under some, and in a subtle way too. But I had come to the Friday night and I had put in a large week's work. I was thoroughly burned out in every single way. And at that point, really, I thought, you know, some alcohol is essentially be medicinal. But it wasn't on the plan. So I didn't, I didn't. I saved myself from it. And I just had that sort of heavy, dry feeling. And I just went to bed and I got up the next day. All right, I um, had an email from a friend. And like me, from time to time, he practices, remote viewing, other psychic exercises with occasional striking success, but maddeningly to us both with no sort of consistency. And so he he wrote me, he said that he had tried an exercise and he even, you know, do this maybe every few weeks or months or so. And it had been a remote viewing exercise of the future for the future 50 years out. I had a particular set of, of impressions but he is alive enough to, to, you know, the dangers in this to actually read much into them. There are some novel observations, but there's still, he, of course, accepts it is expectation, conscious and subconscious, could be driving it. So, for instance, to give you one, he had an impression of where he was that at this point in the future, it's, it's much less popular. And he had this series of impressions that the world, is much less populated. Buildings are abandoned, run down, infrastructure isn't being maintained, uh, roads are being overgrown, that kind of thing. But again, this is can be this can be to do with your expectation. So I thought, well, okay, I'm I'm pretty dry, I'm pretty pissed off at my own efforts. I thought I'd in my sitting I'd go through the regular exercises and I thought I'd, I'd try something like this. this is on Saturday morning. Now with those sort of meditative efforts, when you get some momentum on it, you quite quickly enter those 
you know, other states. And in this, in on this morning, I was especially remarkably clear and empty. And the mind isn't racing. The mind is pretty. There are no thoughts there. You know, bubbling up and, and they seem very relaxed and so I thought to try this exercise. Now, I've long been of the habit of responding to my own intuitions as to how to go about it. Now you, re you can read any number of remote viewing protocols or efforts like this but you know my sense of it is that you, you sort of trust your own intuition at a particular point. So I sat there and I tried the protocol that he'd, he'd forwarded me that had been tried by a guy called Schwartz with several hundred other people sometime in the 70s. And I tried that and I wasn't getting on it really. You know, one or two things popped up, but uh, again, just it's just the noise. It's just the white noise, I, I'd say, from subconscious. But then, um, so I tried various visualizations. So I imagine myself looking at my laptop over, I wasn't going for 50 years out, I thought I'd try up the next 10 years. So I imagine myself looking at a screen over 10 years. I got nothing either, but interestingly, the form of my laptop changed. You know, I it was a silver MacBook now, and then it sort of switched to out of a, a, a black laptop, a smaller one at a later point, maybe. But anyway, it was just that, that was one interesting point, but again, it's sort of, it's the white noise. It's just these things come up. And so sat there, I thought, well, I'll try and be precise what I, shall, what I should do. I'll try it out month by month, year by year, June 2015, July 2015, and see, do I have any impression? What I noticed as I did it, when I came first to September 2015, is that there's, this, there's a particular vibration that, I, I feel when my meditation particularly stabilizes. Now, I, I find it hard to explain it beyond that point, but it's because it's, it's obviously an, it's an inner experience, but it's quite definite and it's one very familiar to me. It's something that started happening, I'd say, two, three years ago that with meditation i'd feel this and with this vibration there's a change in your feeling and your being this is a you know the traditions would say this is just a sort of the the concentration of the spiritual energy you know it's manifesting itself now as i as i proceeded as i went past september 2015 this vibration stopped and then i went back to september 2015 it, it would start. Now, interesting with this vibration is that it was moving, it happened faster than my thinking about it. So as I'd move on to a month, it, it, so I was simply, the first thought would be, for instance, October 2016. The vibration would happen before I could start internally commenting on, oh, there's no vibration yet, or should there be? So, you know, not, none of that. It would just happen. So it was almost like a metal detector that I ran it over something in a beep. And that's the best analogy you can come to. What I found is that with certain dates, the results were repeated, whether I was going forwards or backwards. Now, the dates were, and I, I did this about three times, uh, were for September 2015. There is something there. But then, October 2016 through to December 2017, which is to say that the, my sense of that is because I was looking, you know, quote unquote, looking for events and developments of the magnitude I've long expected, that there will be something will happen in September 2015 that will be represent a sort of a discrete event and there will be a recovery or a healthy response. And, you know, life goes back to normal, quote unquote, in October 2015, right through to September 2016. Then in October 2016, it seemed there's any, any validity, veracity, 
I'm saying is some things are happening on October 2016, which continue. Now, I've been doing this sort of thing a long time. And in terms of a scale, where will I position it? This was one of like those clearest results and results. And easily, the, the, the result I've been most impressed by in all my years doing this sort of thing. I have to say, I already did have a sense for September 2015. However, I've had no expectation of October 2016 or November or December, January 2017 at all. Um, and I found as I sat to do the exercise, at that point in time, my you know, my mind was very clear and empty and relaxed. So the role of, you know, your subconscious, whatever expectations you bring, I think they were very, very minimized at that point in time. Now, all in all, as I said, I was very impressed by the results. I thought I'd, I'd I've said it, mentioned it to a few people because, well, there are two reasons. One, a sense I have for events is that there will be a point in time will come where there will be decisions which will be critical. Uh, you know, this stands to reason. Times of high stress, decisions, you know, the outcomes will be very, very, very acutely dependent. Uh, acutely path dependent on, on decisions made at certain points. So you may have a decision whether, well, do I stay or do I go in Southern Italy, for example. And, and alongside that is my sense is that when certain things happen, people will not respond properly. They won't see things for what they are. And so I've mentioned this because in October 2016, I think things will start to happen and many people will misread and as a result, I believe we'll suffer for it. The second part is I've also just wanted to, I'm putting on record because in a way I'm exposing or not exposing, I'm forcing myself to be honest with my own efforts here. It's actually so safe, September comes and goes. Well, then I have to look back closely on what's happening and my own understanding of what I'm doing. You know, if I end up, if you like, with, with the failure, well, I have to account for it to myself. And I'll then. So I'm not sure what you said all of that, but I'm, you know, I just have something worth sharing. Well, it's a proper strategy that you've undertaken. If you, uh, in the course of, of meditation or in trying to, to look and discern what may be coming, experience something that you regard as significant, then rather than keep it private and uh, sort of subject to the laws of inner confusion um, by telling people as you have, you can benefit later um, based on what outcome there seems to be in actuality. So that makes perfectly good sense to me. As far as what events may come, I mean, we could speculate endlessly. You can certainly see all sorts of tendencies out there. And from those tendencies, infer what large events may occur. To me, I'm completely agnostic on the, um, on the issue, partly because, as you point out, an individual's own interests and uh, so on can shape or contaminate these experiences but uh, partly because I think the nature of the future itself is an unresolved issue. So what we're doing when we see the future is entirely up for grabs, given that the future itself may not be at all what we think it is. We use the principle of analogy. We suppose that when we're discussing the future, we're talking about a separate or different now. So we suppose that there is a present and that we, you know, and then further, we suppose we're talking about a different present. And that different present, which we arrange in a linear fashion, you know, 
succeeding our own, we suppose, is the quote-unquote future. But it may be altogether different than that. I don't know. And that's part of the problem as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, when it comes down to these, uh, you know, for, for various predictions, I mean, I, it, it seems to me at least 90% of the internet is filled with various predictions and prophecies for the future. But, you know, people have to be honest and acknowledge very, very few people with any sort of reasonable track record uh, with events at all. I mean, how, how many people had a prediction of 9-11? Well, I know two who claimed after the event, one I trust and one I wouldn't. The first was Jay Weidman, who said, I have this right, he claimed that Cliff Hardy of the WebBot project had told him that in September, I think, he told him in January of 2001 that there would be a major event, a terrorist event in September, October 2001. It was a very, very, very impressive, if it was true, account. But um, that was not public, so it can't be tested. The other one I know was the same said friend. He said he had a vision, a lucid, very lucid dream just days before, of planes crashing into to the Statue of Liberty. Now, of course, it's not the same, but you could, in a way, take it as um, a foretelling of what was to come. Now, he's not a public figure, and he didn't make any sort of public announcement. And he'd be, and I, I would hold trust him. He says he saw this thing, he saw it. And, but by the same token, he'd be the first to tell you there are many other things he had no intimation, things that affected him personally and severely. And they didn't come up. Another one was, well, I remember now that we speak about we mentioned it last time, was the Bible. And it had a prediction that there would be a war to the knife, which the journalist interpreted as a, as a war on terrorism. And I think this was, this was published before 2001. So that, in a way, is quite impressive. Another set of predictions which, you know, seem to, to have come to pass, well, not come to pass, has been Billy Myers has made a series of predictions. But he spoke about it a long time ago, about Russian revanches, which at the time he made them, when I first read them, I thought they were absolutely ridiculous, um, involving Russian conflict with Scandinavia. It seemed like just nonsense what he was writing. But then, of course, you know, just just today I read the the Russians have directly have stated to, to that if Sweden joins NATO, there will be consequences. A couple of weeks ago, the Finnish government took care to to write on nine hundred thousand reservists of what they are to do in the event of a national emergency. So that, you know, there's there might be might be something to that. But apart from that, I really can't think of anyone who's actually made a, a series of impressive predictions that were proved accurate. I, I don't know about you. I don't know who comes to mind when you're trying to. Well, I, you know, the only so-called prophets of any significance seem to me to be Edgar Casey and Nostradamus. I mean, those are very problematic examples, but it seems to me, even though they were far from 100% accurate, there seemed to be more accuracy. They seem to be discerning more than um, most everybody else. But it makes me think of the issues with the um, various warnings given by extraterrestrials, aliens. I think I'm going to stick with that term from now on. I am rejecting this term visitors. <laughs> um, oh, I, you know, to, to double back before, before I, I lost it, before I lose this thought, the your account of finding that door in uh, Pompeii, going to an area the public were excluded from this remarkable alley. Have you given any thought to what Strieber would make of that sort of material? <laughs> well, naturally, it was a time slip. I entered a parallel universe. 
Egg Obviously. I, only I saw, and then I, I was transported back to Pompeii, but because it was a dark, you know, part of the uh, town where there weren't a lot of homes or buildings, I was unaware of the fact that I was actually in ancient Rome. And that's a good point you make, yeah. Well, there you go with Streber. I mean, that's a case in point. Now, if we look at the uh, dire warnings given as predictions by aliens, um, you have to ask why it is that there are so many that can't all be true. Yeah. And in Secret School, which I was forced to read recently, that's the book, I believe, where he says that um, the idea of time is given to him by aliens was that uh, the past is sort of a block of ice on the left and the future is water on the right and the water transitions into ice through the so-called present so that there's a lot more potential and uh, flexibility in the future and things become fixed in the past. So it could be that the future itself is a multitude. This is sort of what I was getting at in the comment earlier. And um, there's more. There's more reason for thinking that than just the the basis of um, one account of how the the aliens regard time. I mean, it, it's occurred to me for a long time that when we talk about the now or the present, this is really just um, we're referring to a, a mental schema, a more a geometric device than anything tangible. Relativity, at least the way it's been popularized, tells us that, for instance, uh, it takes light something like eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. So if we look at the sun, what we're seeing is not the sun now, but the sun eight minutes ago. Likewise, if we're looking at distant galaxies, we're not seeing the galaxy now. We're seeing the galaxy as it appeared a million years ago, a hundred million years ago. When you carry this to its logical conclusion, there is no now, because everything that you're encountering is deferred. You're in a whole network of deferred nows, none of which add up to a single absolute now of any sort. And consider that also when we're talking about the brain. If you regard the brain as a giant parallel system of neurons all firing at different times, if you were to uh, you know, really flash freeze it down to the smallest unit you can imagine so that you've got firing taking place from one neuron to another and being stopped in between, where's the now? You know, in some parts of the brain, the, uh, the neural traffic has arrived. And in that context, you might say, well, there's a sort of now. But that now, that region is sharing a context with others that have not arrived, they have not finished products. So there's no now even in terms of the brain. You could take the electrical activity of a neuron going from uh, one to the other as being um, basically the same as the light you know, coming from the sun. It's a past event. There is no precise single moment of a now that you can point to anywhere. Well then, how right or legitimate is it to regard the future as just a different now, a different geometric point on a line that just happens to be ahead? Well, you can't. So there again, what are we talking about when we're talking about seeing the future or predicting the future? Well, it's an open question, to say the least. Yeah, but what is just in what you're saying, uh, that, that this, the, the idea that there really are sort of dis discrete units of past, present, and future um, is inferior to the idea that we're just generally looking at a, a continuum. But I think even at that point, you know, like some, some, you still do have points which are, even if they do bleed and blend into each other, you do have points from, from us now, which are separate from any elastic definition of the present, which is to say then the idea of the future is still useful. Well, it's not my point to say that it's useless or to um, problematize it in that way. 
I'm just trying to um, lay the basis for a possible better understanding of what it is when we say that we're seeing the future. I'm not saying that it's necessarily um, impossible to do on account of the fact that there's no now, there's no future. And you can, of course, regard time as a continuum and probably should. And if you follow Strieber and his um, sort of appropriation of past efforts by Uspensky and others to see time as, in effect, a fourth spatial dimension, in consequence of which you can see time itself from the outside, in a sense, as a completed object. Well, if you if you go that way, then um, not only is it a continuum, but you know, I'm not disregarding the um, meaningfulness of events either, events as a category, but it still remains to be answered how there can even be a now. Not just um, in terms of what I was saying a moment ago, but why is there a now at all and what we refer to as a now and not the future or the past? Why, why do we have any experience of time at all if, let's say, time is a completed object? You see what I mean? I mean, what is the... Yeah, best? no. Well, well, then, in some objective space, you know, objective sense, I think if time is another dimension, then... Our, our sense of the present is, 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 a, is a subjective construct that seems that, that seems valid to us because it's one we collectively hold to. The human race as a whole has a certain pattern of attention to select in our awareness certain events and developments which we find are close to us and as a result you know with this collective illusion or this collective impression we do derive this sense of the now if that were simply the case what you're saying it seems to me that on the edges people who are more distant from the collective we would have much more evidence of um four different experiences of time that's exactly what i have in mind see this is what that's what's actually foreshadowing what I'm, what I'm thinking of here because it comes up a lot in in you know various spiritual traditions this idea of time and the experience of time i have honestly largely ignored it because i've never actually I, i've not i'm not that far down that road where my sense of time has begun to to break up i mean Spensky mentions it Spensky mentions it in, in um talks about it in, i think it's to trio morganum but he wrote that before he got involved with the Gurdjieff work. And later he never really, he, he didn't elaborate on some of the ideas he brought up about time. Morris Nickel did, um, and he did write a book, Living Time. Now, funnily enough, a few months ago, I did actually make a point of sitting down, taking notes, and making a very close study of that. But as I said, I've always found it a top difficult to relate to. I mean, I, I have another book here on my shelf, you know, I've been meaning to read, and, and that, that's from a Zen Buddhist uh, on the experience of living time. And the, these books and the, this sort of thought there is, seen, is suggestive of this idea that there are people whose experience of time is, is fundamentally, uh, fundamentally and radically different. It, you know, alongside that, a common report of people who have reached the heights and spiritual development is that they don't ex they say that you have a very poor experience of change but this is repeated that nothing is changing and and what we think is changing is all happening in slow motion that's for now so ultimately and crudely to the extent that i've thought about this at all which and I, again i stay i haven't given this much thought i've not been able to see it's practical any pragmatic purpose in it is that for people who i suppose undo their inherited pattern of, of attention in that then maybe more broadly able to apprehend that dimension of time and they actually come into a fuller sense of reality whereas the rest of us we are 
born into and are happy to stay with this shifting pattern of attention, which gives, which, you know, gives us a sense of, you know, present and near future and far future and the rest. I tend to see that still as a bit of a, a small difference. In other words, I don't think that even mystical experiences of eternity and so on are that at that much of a remove from everyday experience. It seems to me that everyday experience is still the starting point and then some distance is gained, but that still fundamentally characterizes a person experiencing as a human being trapped in time. You know, the, um, the fact that you can break time, well, not really break time, but consider or conceive of time in terms of discrete quanta, it's true that that can be um, overcome. In other words, if you consider the way that we connect quantity and time, you know, we have clocks and we associate them with a number line and the clocks repeat and so on. And we talk about seconds and minutes and hours and that sort of thing. You can consider topology, the mathematical discipline, sometimes called rubber sheet geometry, where if you take, uh, you know, for example, uh, I don't know, a donut, treating it as if it's made of a rubber sheet, you can distort it and um, transform it into all sorts of other shapes that, according to topology, are equivalent. So a, a donut might become a coffee cup. And when you're treating everything as elastic in that way, you're not dealing so much with discrete quanta anymore. Um, you can use that as a way to kind of intuitively guide yourself to non-quantified, more elastic notions of what time is, or the experience of time in any case. But to me, even with that, I don't think that, number one, it's so far a jump from everyday experience, and number two, that it brings us all that much closer to understanding why we have an experience of time at all, which to me is, is part of the problem. Now, I had a friend who was a contactee, and he recounted to me one time that he had somehow asked the question or the subject had come up that, uh, you know, he wanted to know what time was. And the image or the notion, the set of notions given to him was that of a film projector where time is like a film, but the now is whatever frame is up at a particular moment. Well, that, to me, that just begs the question, because what then is the projector? in the lens for us. Even if you say consciousness, to me that's still not quite good enough. That's still begging the question to a large extent because consciousness is obviously intimately connected with time. You might say it's a product of time. You might say time is a product of consciousness. It becomes almost tautological. So why is there then consciousness at all if, if consciousness is just a certain way of the universe relating to itself through time. You're still invoking this category of time to begin with. So I still haven't found an acceptable, understandable basis for the now, for there being a present at all. Saying that it's rooted in consciousness to me is, is evading the issue, and uh, we're stuck with the question. Well, it's it. I find it interesting you got that analogy of the movie projector and the screen because this is a this is a very common analogy used to explain well, you know human human consciousness and, and human experience that you know the that the light of the movie projector is consciousness itself and the lens is the ego it's um or the film, rather, is the ego, and it's you know ultimately and substantially against the light. Now, you know, I would I would just wonder, you know, that it, whether your friend or in this this contact you know, whether he had been aware of that analogy before he was told, before he received that idea from the visitors. There's no like, was it? Oh, okay, there's no, way, yeah. no way to know, and there's no way I could even yeah. guess really. Yeah, okay. Well, what makes sense to me is that, is that if, if you end up, you have, uh, you treat time as a dimension, three other dimensions of space, 
Well, then that itself is you end up with some sort of four dimensional object, which is the universe, past, present, and future. That itself sits in some uh, pure consciousness itself. I mean, that's that's what your spiritual teachings tell you is that it sort of it arises out of the, you know the pure light and pure awareness of consciousness. And what people, as far as I can gather, when they're talking. The mystics have spoken about their experience of time and how that begins to change. It is that they experience more closely that light of, of, of pure consciousness. So their own identification, their own awareness is shifting from experience of part of that object and it's retreating back into its natural unchanging condition. Because that's the other, that's the other uh, I think, relevant part of the experience of higher states of consciousness is that there is this point of it is it doesn't change it's unchanging it's permanent and infinite and this almost hyperbolic language is used as an employee here so when we're talking about you know you, you say you're you know you're dissatisfied with how consciousness finds its way in, in this you know in that, in that conversation there i think it's important to really tease out exactly what's meant by this i think there is for me, at least, it's useful to separate on a, a, you know, your everyday sentence of self-identity with that consciousness with a capital C, which is the goal and the ground of all of all spiritual endeavor. But I, I do know from previous discussions, you seem to have, you know, you bring a critical, really critical dimension or edge to what you see, what you find in a, in a lot of um, spiritual discussion I, I i'm personally interested to hear what how you see the problem and how the spiritual traditions conceive of this of this notion of self-awareness and how that can change towards something they would call higher consciousness well there are two things that come to mind as a way to answer your question first off is that my first misgiving about specifically the way time is conceived is that it is always derivable through human reason. In other words, um, if you take the ordinary idea of the dialectic, or let's say um, we're talking about whether or not uh, green cucumbers are immoral, and uh, you know, you say that green cucumbers are immoral, and uh, I disagree and claim the opposite, and I say, uh, you know, green cucumbers are the opposite, and then someone else rejects the uh, opposition altogether and says, um, well, it, it's not that they're moral or immoral, but rather that they're tasty. You know, negation of the negation in Hegelian terms. Well, this is a path through reason. This is a, a, a movement through human reason. Likewise, when you're talking about understandings of time, as you can show them historically, the differentiation between finite and infinite and, um, you know, the whole category of the eternal, all the way up to Strieber's idea that time is really an eternity that's not experienced as infinite, but it's a simultaneous now. All of these are derivable through human reason. You know, in other words, they seem to me to bear the signs of having been obtained through thought rather than through anything else. And that includes mystical experiences of time and the accounts thereof. Viewing time as elastic to me doesn't necessarily bring us any closer or imply any direct observation of what time is from the outside, quote unquote. Rather, it seems to me to be sim a simple divorce from the uh, quantified understanding of time in favor of an elastic one where, you know, the idea that nothing is changing at all is just a very elasticized version of what we started with. Which brings me to the second, the second yeah. thing, in order to answer your question, which is that because these understandings are derivable and therefore likely derived through human reason more than anything else, a lot of these traditions of spirituality, it seems to me, are marked by their um, dimensions as social enterprises, even calling them traditions 
sort of lets the cat out of the bag. If we're talking about something like Buddhism, which is regarded as a you know sort of neutral set of spiritual practices and so on, to the extent that these practices are regarded as tradition, something to be handed down, communicated, to the extent that there is such a thing as orthodoxy in Buddhism, well, then you really have to ask the question, how much of this is based on individually derived experience again and again and again? And how much of it is really based on the application of these inherited categories to something that's amorphous, which ends up being shoehorned into the traditional doctrine? You know, if it were so that everybody who in, embarked on the, a spiritual practice, Buddhism or otherwise, and there are all sorts of ones that you can include here, if everybody was able to independently achieve some sort of internal reality, in other words, you know, what, 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 what do we really refer to when we talk about the difference between the external and the internal? We're talking about differences in the way they behave. It's not so much that one exists in space, quote unquote, and the other does not. It's the way that they behave. Um, if I say to you, you know, pass me that chair, um, you're able to take the words and take the signifier chair and um, somehow pass me the physical object that I was referring to. So, in the same way that the results of experimental science should be repeatable, the external world itself bears something of that within it. The internal world, we have no such proof, to put it primitively. You may be right, but that's, again, not how uh, lineage establishes itself and say something like Buddhism, is that the proof is found proof, if you like, proof that there's that, is found at that subtle level of transmission. So, for instance, if a Zen Buddhist student, he, he does not need, in theory, he does not need to tell his Roshi, his teacher, that he has reached, he's at a Kensho or a Satori, because there will be a marked energetic difference in the student that the teacher can non-verbally detect. And that's of a par with the whole issue of transmission, which stands inside all of these traditions, is that people who reach these higher states transmit an energy which can be felt without anything being said. So to the extent there is an external validation, you know, the question, is there an external validation? In the way, they would say, yes, there is. Because you can see, you can see the effect. Uh, you, you can see the effect of the realization of certain states. Well, I doubt that very much. I'm not saying it's absolutely untrue, but I doubt it very much. Because when I look at other areas of human endeavor where transmission is the um, central issue, um, I, what I see is that the transmission rarely succeeds past a generation or two. You know, you look at uh, psychoanalysis, for example, brand new tradition, and you have the, the central mind, the, you know, the main figure, Freud, and then you had uh, a first generation of Freudians who as thinkers, you would say they were strong thinkers and independent, but already Freud, Freudianism, if you want to call it that, was a corruption of Freud. Every major Freudian thinker was, I mean, essentially a heretic. He went off and did his own independent thing, and, and many of them still claimed, oh, well, this was the real essence of Freud. You know, So you've got Jung, or you've got uh, uh, Klein, and you've got all these various others who will take some small aspect of Freud's thinking and say, ah, oh, well, this was the real discovery. Really, they're all wrong. And then after that, you've got a second generation of separate followers. The, the message gets diluted and diluted and diluted. You see it in musical performance, performance practice. You know, I have had occasion in the past year or two to go back 
and um, go through the pa- painful process of listening to really early recordings of classical music. You know, we're talking very early stuff, 1910, 1900, even 1880, the very few that survive. And it's a painful process because no one would willingly submit to that, you know, ordinarily, because all you're hearing is static and noise, right? The recording technology was bad, and what survives is even worse. But if you're at the point where you can kind of separate that and somehow imaginatively reconstruct I'm not talking about pretending that it's good and then, you know, convince. I'm talking about somehow trying to hear how it sounded in a room when it was being performed um, based on the fragment of what's still audible. You find a night and day difference between performance then and performance today. And despite all of, you know, the media aspects of classical music i mean today it's a joke just as a side note uh you know you go to a a cd store those who might still do that or you find classical recordings online and the whole basis for having a uh, a recording produced is whether or not you're photogenic as a performer so you get all these gorgeous performers soloists right especially women but you know you're not going to get a solo album unless you're extremely photogenic but what you know what are the chances that all of these people who are photogenic who get these recording contracts are actually the performers who deserve the contracts the best ones in other words well the chances are negligible especially when you compare what they're doing to the way it was done when it was still in living tradition this is my point there there's a very brief moment in time when something is in living tradition you can look at music as a prime example. I mean, jazz lasted only a couple decades, really. And for each type of classical music, it lasted only for a couple decades. Now, in the classical tradition, a given form was replaced, thankfully, by another form, which itself lasted a couple decades. But nothing lasted more than a couple decades, really. So, everywhere I look where there's an issue of transmission, I see the same decay and disappearance of what was really there. And I think that decay and disappearance is coextensive with the biological reality of human beings. You know, um, you have somebody who, as a young adult, totally blazes a trail and comes up with something new. Maybe of a generation, a group of people who do the same. And then uh, as they get older, their own performance starts to decline and then the transmission um, is slightly altered. Look at linguistics, for Christ's sake. Look at the way linguistic systems constantly mutate and change over time. And unfortunately, a lot of things become unintelligible to people. You know, I can go back and read uh, Raymond Chandler or Dashiell Hammett today and enjoy it thoroughly, or other writers from the 20s and 30s with the high slang and the, the really strongly American slant. But 90% of Americans today can't do that. They would consider it a foreign language, unintelligible to them, of no interest. Because the ground has slid sufficiently far out from under them. They're now in a different place. So how would you transmit that tradition? Look at the people who try to write stories using certain fictional characters of the past. You can pick up in the bookstore all sorts of Sherlock Holmes anthologies written by, you know, the great writers of the present day. And they're all shit. They don't capture anything of the original. None of the mysteries are solved through rigorous, disciplined thinking. They're all kind of namby-pamby, you know, schlock, sentimental solutions. It's garbage. You look at people who try to write uh, H.P. Lovecraft fiction. Lovecraft is a terrible writer. But at least this world that he created, this universe, was distinctive. But people can't even write in a convincing way to imitate him. Everywhere you look, it's that way. I mean, look at Doctor Who, for Christ's sake. Doctor Who, (laughs) what's on the BBC now and has been for the last, I don't know, six or seven years, to me is utter garbage, you know? It's got nothing to do with the original. They were not able to recreate the internal logic of that fictional universe, even just, you know, I don't know, 20 years after the show had gone off the air. I mean, whereas before you had this um, classic English eccentric, 
who happened to be a time lord, quote unquote, and you had episodes that imitated all of the, you know, English class structure. And you had sci science fiction in a discernible way. Now it's basically the the doctor is an anime figure. He's kind of like an emo kid. And, uh, you know, all of the plots are retarded to the point of being nonsensical. Whereas Doctor Who 30 years ago to might, might have been written for a 13 or 14 year old. Now it's written for a six year old. And uh, I could go on about that. I haven't even I've watched a few episodes a couple of years ago and I found it unwatchable. But uh, anywhere you look, you try to recreate a tradition and it fails. The living essence of it dies out only in something like mathematics which is so heavily symbolic and maintained by its own internal formal rules, do you have anything approaching a successful transmission? And even that is not as clear as one might think. So how, for example, Buddhism, which is based on ultimately kind of like the solipsistic internal experience, is successfully transmitted when you know, you're talking about texts that were a thousand years old and the linguistics have all changed or even worse when you move from one language to another you know you've got people who are native english speakers who say that they're practicing buddhists or and again buddhism isn't the only example but you see my point now my view is that probably in the beginning of buddhism and in other what are today regarded as disciplines there was authentic experience genuine spiritual insights that they gave the names that they had on hand and expressed in the language available to them. And if you want to recover those insights, you'd have to go back and really examine what texts survive and understand the nuance. But I don't see a lot of evidence that that has really been done. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure I'd respond exactly to what you say. As you're talking about you know, mathematics and transmission there and the efforts to recreate cultural forms of the past. We give Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who, you're pointing to real degeneration all the time, which you, you seem to think, which, you, which seems by what you're saying, you, you feel is inevitable. And if you can see this in other forms of human endeavor, then surely it applies to, you know, spiritual traditions too. What I think my understanding of what's meant by transmission in the Buddhist tradition is that the at a certain point the efforts to develop the other bodies of the human being the subtle causal and non-dual bodies of the human being they're successful and that they're observed they're, they're noticeable to those who've already developed those bodies or at least have them embryonic and for buddhism it sustained itself by successfully, it claims, well, by successfully repeating the Buddha's realization of enlightenment, of nirvana. Like Buddhism is not fundamentally about the historic Buddha. Buddhism is, fun, is fundamentally about the Buddha, about the enlightened mind, which can be realized by any being at any point in time. There, as far as I can tell, there doesn't seem to be any confusion about uh, that or any doubt that this is actually happening, that there are many realized Buddhist masters, that many Buddhists accept as such and question them. Now, is this a question of they have a host of concepts which they've received by the tradition and they then are trying to attach this to the experience and they convince themselves that yes this person is enlightenment maybe maybe there's an element of that but i think alongside that there really is that experience of that subtle experience in the subtle body where you feel the energetic development of, a, of another being which is really outside of all sorts of debates and and, and discussion it's not a it's not some sort of uh, intellectual transmission it's a it's a sensual experience which confirms, which confirms the existence of something which you at first intellectually suspect, and that suspicion drives your efforts, which then lead to this sensual confirmation. Well, it could well be. You know, I grant that if that is the case, that 
because of the nature of it, it may well have no sort of cultural implications. It may not manifest itself in a measurable way. In other words, to me, if you have a whole civilization, sticking again with the example of Buddhism, if you have, you know, thousands of years of people successfully reaching these goals and maybe even becoming possessed of powers that we might call supernatural, it seems to me that the the effects would be noticeable, even in terms of world history. You know, if these Mm -hmm. things are happening on anything like a routine basis, and if um, you know, spiritual practice is able to uh, confer these types of totally extraordinary abilities and transmit the means of conferring those abilities over the course of generations or centuries and so on, it seems to me that the world we live in today would be very different than it is. I'm not saying it would lurch into a utopian paradise or anything like that. I'm simply saying that when you look around you, and uh, you look at the basic character of the world over time across history, it's sort of a certain thing, and that would be something very different. However, I grant that maybe there's something essential about the extraordinary in connection with all that that means that it, by definition, can't surface in human history, quote-unquote, if history is really nothing more than the long chronicle of violence and carnage and so on that it may very well be. But again, I'm doubtful. You yeah. Know, you could you could chalk that up to um, a Streber influence as well, because if you have your view of these things shaped by somebody like a Streber who makes the point again and again that there's no supernatural, it's just an expanded natural world, and these things are a reality, and that the reality is visible in cultural terms and so on and so forth. When you look at these historic spiritual practices and you don't see what appears to be any kind of, I don't know, you picture dominoes. One domino will knock down another domino and so on and so on. I don't see a lot of sign of the effects of the of the so-called successes. So sure. personally, it's undecidable. I'm, I'm simply saying that I don't see it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, it, I mean, it's... it's what the again, you know, what has been said is the well, the first thing I'd say is when you actually ask, well, how many people historically have ever become enlightened? And there was a Zen master, I can't quite recall who said it, and he said maybe a few hundred within the Zen or the Chan Buddhist tradition. You know, you're looking at trace numbers. It's not that they're it's not it doesn't represent a significant social force, it's not whole communities of people who, who become aligned. It's just not happening. Um, the traditions themselves explain that by the fact the vast, vast majority of people just aren't interested. And even within Buddhism, even in, in Buddhism, that when we're talking about efforts towards enlightenment, they, they're just that's an, an esoteric core of the religion. The vast majority of it is just straight out um you know superstition and, and sort of petitionary prayer to higher powers and ritualistic forms that serve social functions and, and for the overwhelming majority of people they're just not interested now as to the effects of these people these enlightened beings on the world again what the traditions have said is that if it weren't for their presence human history would have been an awful lot darker you know, now as to what form that would take, I don't know. But, you know, we can see that it has been in many instances, it's a close run thing. If things had just worked out a little differently at certain points in time, we'd be living in a much, much darker world. The Nazis had got their invasion of Russia off maybe a couple of months earlier, then Moscow fell and you'd have, they would have won in the East. So what sort of a world would that be? Um, or maybe the Cold War would have, would have reached a very hot end. And, taking the rest of humanity with it. Um, you know, we just, you know, because these are completely, you know, they're unknowables. And 
But again, the tradition says that those are those literal, uh, relative handfuls of people, their enlightenment, their consciousness has, it bounces out the sheer concentrated negativity of so many hundreds of millions to the point that it does, you know, it explains or creates that world we have today. Um, for me, I, I don't find it a problem accepting it because I think I've experienced it. I, I've met people who I felt and I experienced had reached a higher level of consciousness. I felt, like on a, on a, on a visceral level almost, very, very different in the presence. For me, those experiences satisfy any skepticism I have. But, but of course, that's, that's not very helpful in a one-on-one in -on -one conversation or if you're trying to through some intellectual conclusions about things. But, you know, I, I rely on an argument given by Ken, Ken Wilbur. You know, he talks about that a lot of disciplines, intellectual, a lot of disciplines and traditions, they rely on a certain inner development in one way or another for you to access the authority and truths of that tradition. So it gives a stupid example with astronomy. If you want to see the outer planets, well, you have to look through a telescope. You can't just say, well, fuck it, I'm not looking through the telescope and then deny the truths of the tradition of astronomy. He would say equally, if you don't meditate and engage in these practices, well, you're, you're not going to see these, these higher states. You're not going to experience these other bodies. And as a result, you really can't participate in the, in the discussion. Well, I, I would see it somewhat differently. For me, the parallel would be asking the question, for example, do telescopes exist? Now, perhaps there are no pictures of telescopes anywhere and um, no direct evidence of them, but one would think that there would be, you know, sort of implications of telescopes existing. In other words, if there are photographs of far distant galaxies not viewable by the naked eye, you have something that says, ah, oh, well, it looks like a telescope exists because here's a photo. I suppose it comes down to what we're talking about when we use the term enlightenment. And I mean that in this way, you know, if we're talking about human beings who have achieved wisdom, let's bring in that term. If we're talking about fully realized people who have achieved a kind of equanimity and who are compassionate and uh, who are able to avoid doing injustice and so on. And um, for the reason that they have some sort of worldview and experience of the world that is integral to that. Well, that's one thing. I don't see any problem accepting that there have been people across history who have achieved wisdom. And uh, if we're talking about the sort of numbers game of, of good versus bad in world history, then in those cases, I would agree with you. If we, you know, minus those people, human history would probably be far for the worse. However, if we're talking about enlightenment in the sense of Buddhism that I've encountered, that we're really talking about not only all that, but supernatural powers. They don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily go with enlightenment. To, it's not that enlightenment automatically involves acquisition of the city. What they say is that the city can manifest in, in around the person, around the enlightened person, but they can come and go. And those who pursue enlightenment are repeatedly warned against seeking the cities to ignore them, that they're a distraction. But it's many enlightened beings have not demonstrated city and have no control of them. Well, then I suppose it would come down to discussing what tradition we're talking about, so I'm being, being more specific. This may be the fault of being general. But to my mind, um, till now, if we're talking about whatever we're referring to when we use the term Buddhism, for example, these cities and enlightenment, it seemed to me we're all of a piece. And you may well be right. They may uh, be cautioned. Uh, you may be cautioned to avoid them. And they may not be the object. But in a sense, I have taken them to be the object in as much as, in some sense, they confer legitimacy upon the enlightened. 
where you've got one, you've got the other, and therefore we've got the other, then probably you have the one, and so on and so forth. I mean, if we're talking about being able to energetically sense the development of another being, to me that verges on the supernatural. Yeah, and again, it's how they conceive it. And when we're talking about the traditions, I'll be useful just to pin down, or I'll pin down what I mean by that. Essentially, the Indian traditions, whether it's Hinduism, Jainism, or Buddhism, I, I think they're of a piece in their understanding here that the you know the energetic sensation or the energetic feeling of of, an, of the development of someone else comes about from the development of the the kosha the, those the bodies. So people do develop a subtle body which will give them subtle senses, which they can feel. You know they can pick up the development, the subtle development of somebody else. That's how they explain. It. So in that instance, that's not a city. That's a permanent acquisition that follows from the development of the body. In terms of like stuff like levitation, uh, kinesis, and all, all the rest of it, they, 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 they sort of fade in and out. But I should say that in the last, since these traditions have been exposed to the West, there is very little record of of many people seeing these and recording. There's a lot of secondhand stories, but a few first-hand accounts. Well, you know, if if we were to distinguish something like a Buddhism from, let's say, Western self-help techniques that may even include yoga and all that sort of thing, it seems to me that the name for the interval would be the supernatural. That is, if something like Buddhism or one of these other traditional disciplines is not just a grab bag of self-help techniques, the reason why is because of its connection to some more essential reality, one that perhaps is invisible, but that is accessible, and that one discovers through the use of techniques and through engaging in the practice and so on. So if we're talking about anything that has a reality in connection with what might be called the supernatural, this is sort of what I'm getting at. It seems to me that if you had this group of people over time butting heads with the supernatural in anything like a consistent way, and again, I'm not saying it's impossible because it's possible, but if you did, it seems to me that there would be a more noticeable impact or noticeable traces of it in human culture and in world history. And it's, I suppose, easy to misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not making a strong case that there's no evidence of it, therefore it doesn't exist. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you look at the subtleties of history and the interaction of cultures and everything based on what we have available to us, it seems to me anyway, as a general rule, that where there is the intrusion of the supernatural into the natural, again, using those terms provisionally, it's something very distinct. It's, it's not something that just sort of happens casually or just has a casual set of effects on the immediate vicinity. I think any time you introduced the genuinely supernatural into the quote-unquote natural, you have a really massive distortion because you're looking at the um, interconnection of two different spheres, again, dividing them provisionally. But, you know, in this case, I think meaningfully. So I think there would be discernible effects in world history if you had this sort of traditionalized access to the supernatural. Now, you see what we have today, assuming that we um, are willing to agree that this is all quote-unquote real, is that you have supernatural always appearing as an anomaly. So you have all of these single-case fringe events, and even if it happens to the same people for example, alien abductions happening over the course of a lifetime. That's one person. It's not happening to all the neighbors around them. So in some respect, every instance of the supernatural appears as a, as a site of rupture in the everyday world. And it's always a kind of single case of rupture. Again, even if specific instances happen repeatedly, the fact is that the effects are always extremely localized. Now, if you had a giant spiritual tradition, basically, you know, you had this kind of um, formulaic discipline thanks to which you repeatedly encounter 
the supernatural and these cities appear and so on and so forth. And you have masses of people doing this over countless generations. It just seems to me that we would see a slightly different set of effects in the social sphere and uh, in the historical world. I think human reality would be slightly different than it is. So it's hard to account for why we don't see all of that, looking at it from this perspective, at least. Well, or, you know, you're, you're, you're asking why are there so few miracles in the world? Well, we would see more sites of rupture if you had this coherent civilizational engagement with the supernatural, it seems to me, if the claims and the doctrine exactly equaled what was occurring. Sure. In other words, you could view view something like Buddhism as a great experiment, a grand experiment, because unlike um, something like a Christianity or, or other religions that run in terror from the supernatural or regard it as demonic and so on and so forth, these spiritual practices now engaged in for countless centuries in one part of the world have more or less meant a, a consistent engagement with the supernatural. And how much of that engagement has produced visible signs of engagement? I well, mean, I you think can take what you said. You can take what you said about how we've got a lot of secondhand sources, but very few primary ones. And, and you know, so what, what, what does that mean? Well, I think it's a point worth repeating is that in terms of how many people are engaging with the supernatural, as you've defined it, it's very, very few. It's not, if, you know, you look at Tibet as a Buddhist nation to say that, well, you know, historically you're looking at a community of millions who engage. Even within Tibet, you're still looking at a handful of people who are actually approaching the, you feel like the esoteric heights of, of, of that tradition. Like Tibetan yoga itself divides its, its teachings into nine separate traditions based on the development of the student. Very, very few people ever get to the upper reaches. They just don't. Why? The vast majority of people just aren't interested. They're, ha- they're happy and interested in, in an animal existence. So in that way, they... They get what they want out of the world. They don't want higher energetic effects in their life. I suppose the greater point is then, well, why would that be the case? Because if you're presented with the miraculous, then you are forced to acknowledge that there are, that you're, you know, you, your understanding of reality is, you know, it's wrong. But moreover, you are sort of subjecting yourself to live in, in a lower condition which would automatically force you to orient yourself away from that. I think there's this, out, there's this sort of point where any esoteric tradition, you can't force people into it. They have to freely choose. And that free choice would naturally be upset by a far greater prevalence of the supernatural in the human experience. It's just like with the UFO subject. It just seems finally balanced on this point. If you're willing to accept that there are aliens visiting this planet, there's a mountain of evidence. There's no problem for you to actually, you know, become convinced of that point. However, for skeptics equally, the evidence is not sufficiently strong enough to undo that skepticism. Well, I accept what you say, and I don't think that there's anything in what you're saying that's wrong. I still sort of come at it from a different perspective in as much as... Um, you know, I'm considering the question of whether or not there was a historical Jesus, for example. And the only way that I could see there being a quote-unquote historical Jesus at this point, given the evidence and so on, would be if that Jesus were basically a supernatural event. And if there were some, some absolute incompatibility between human history and the supernatural. So looking at early Christianity and so on, you see no reliable historical corroboration for there being a historical Jesus. You find all sorts of totally different interpretations early on of what it even meant for there to be a Jesus. There seems to be 
a lot of reason to suppose that early Christianity never regarded Jesus as a historical figure, rather as sort of like uh, either a divine incarnation, a supernatural uh, being that came to earth, who was seen only in terms of his image and so on. And there are traces of this in the New Testament even today, where you've got visions of Jesus being seen and so on. And uh, there are so many different interpretations from the very beginning that on the basis of the evidence itself, I think anybody who's intellectually honest and who's encountered the evidence would have to say, well, not only is there no reason to suppose there was this historical Jesus figure, but somehow it's more likely that it was first a myth that existed in many different forms that only later got historicized. That's a secular reading, but my point is that the only chance that I think, given the evidence, you could have historical Jesus would be if there was a Jesus, there was a purely supernatural event, and if there's some basic incompatibility between the supernatural and world history. And, you know, when you go from there, I mean, I would, I would talk about the magnifying effect of the social, right? If we talk about the social sphere, we're not talking about uh, a set of discrete individuals and the social being the sum of the parts. I think the massive amplification and mirroring that goes on is what we're talking about when we talk about the social. And when something becomes a social reality instead of an individual private one, there's like an exponentially greater difference between the whole and the sum of the parts. And it's in that sphere that I would look to see the effects of anything like a consistent or maintained cultural encounter with the supernatural, for example, that comes as a result of religious or spiritual practice performed over time by way of a tradition, it seems to me you would have this sort of wild set of knock-on effects that would substantiate it. Well, one thing I've long noticed is that the sheer number of people you can find who have had extraordinary experiences supernatural experience i think if you've had you can have this conversation in your any group a lot of people have experienced the the anomalous to put it mind i was once once at a point in my life where i would basically ask anyone i met after you know once it reached a socially convenient point to do so have you seen you know a ufo have you ever seen anything interesting in the sky and time and time again, people say, yeah. I'll give you a very, very impressive example. I'll give you two. One, I was um, in the Northern Territory in the desert, the middle of the Australian desert, and I did um, uh, a nighttime tour with astronomy. And of course, there in the heart of Australia, light pollution is nil, effectively. Clear sky. And these people were professional, and they, they ran these tours as a way of supplementing their income. So what they would do is we'd sit out under, you know, on a nighttime sky with torches and lasers. They'd talk your way around what was above us. I asked um, the lady there, I said, have you ever seen anything in them? And she said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and she recounted, she pointed to the area of the sky. They saw lights, and they knew there were no stars there. Like she just spun around and pointed to it like the way you can spin around right now and point to your sink. They said, right over there, we saw things. We immediately called the, there was an observatory, I think, either Perth or Sydney on the coast. They wanted a confirmation. They said, no, we're not seeing anything there. And here you have people who are more than capable of reading the nighttime sky. You know, if they see what they consider to be anomaly in the sky, well then, yeah, there's something there. That's one example. Another example was someone who had been a U.S. naval aviator. And again, I asked the question, do you ever see anything unusual? And he said, oh, yeah. He'd been, uh, he'd been a, I don't know, I can't remember the plane he flew, but it had a crew and they wanted some sort of long-range patrol. And their craft was buzzed by um, an orange sphere, which flew round and round, over and under, back and forth, and then shot off. Whole crew was shaken by it. Got back on the aircraft carrier, told his commanding officer what he saw. His commanding officer said, look, look, man, 
we've all seen this sort of stuff. But whatever you do, don't write it off. You'll never fly again. Um, and there's two instances. And, and, you know, I've noticed this with a lot of things, is that people then don't seem to integrate that experience with the rest of the being. It seems to have a strangely minimal impact on your thinking and feeling. Like, so for instance, or like with this astronomer, or even this pilot that I, I knew, who was a very, uh, a very conventional, conservative, uh, Bible-bashing um, Christian, it didn't seem that he never sat down and reflected on this. He said, look, what, what was that? Was that, that was obviously a product of a higher intelligence. Of, of another culture, of another civilization. Now, what does this possibly mean? What does this mean for my, you know, my convictions, my understanding as a, as a, you know, crude American patriot and a non-thinking Christian? It didn't seem to have any sort of effect there. This astronomer, you know, you, you know, she never thought, the thought never came to her is that as she can see them, they can see her. She never thought that maybe this is a, there's a possibility here for communication and for full scale revision in her field, at least of her understanding, didn't, didn't, didn't enter her head. Saw lies, thought it strange, confirmed it was strange and left it at that. And again and again, I've seen this, uh, you know, people like this is in, in, in my number of acquaintances, I went through them all. I couldn't believe the amount of people who'd seen things. You a bunch of guys who, yeah, you ever seen stuff? Yeah, sure. Sitting on the deck in Sydney, overhead, a satellite seemed to be keep coming round and round and round, right over their head. I was like, oh, that's a satellite. This is the middle, you know, late afternoon or something, bright golden night, and it stopped above them and split into four different parts, shot off four different parts to all points, you know, Four different points. One of the guys there, he said, "Yeah, it was amazing." He said, "It reminded me of something else I saw." And this was in um, he was an American. He said in 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 Arizona, he saw a uh, military jet. To him, it seemed chasing uh, a football shaped object in the sky, like this golden sort of American football shaped object, or but lot larger. And again, you know, he sees these extraordinary things. Is there any integration into the life? No. He's just a very, very, you know, ordinary, regular guy. There's no reflection on the meaning of this at all. And to, you know, get back to what our discussion of, of, of tradition, which is maybe most pretentiously called, but for one of anything else to call them, um, they would say is that people, in ways that they can't see. They do not want to integrate these because it would do for the animal existence to plan for them. Like this, this crude Christian conservative I mentioned, he wants to live that life out. He, do, he does not want it to be, he doesn't want the, the nonsense that it is exposed. And equally, you know, in, in the, the so social sphere where these, where you would expect to find uh, the mark of these events is is strangely unsullied about it. It just doesn't impact our thinking and feeling at all. We just sort of ca we carry on, oblivious. But the traditions would say this is the nature of human consciousness. We choose what we bring into attention before we're born, and we just don't want it. Lars. Well, you know, all this discussion, which is quite interesting, Everything you just said I regard as quite interesting. It makes me think of a sort of a new theory that explains this. And it will take a little bit of unpacking to get it across, so I hope you can bear with me. But it, it just came to me now that we're talking about it, and I think it might have some value. So we're talking about the social. At least that's what I'm calling. And if you take any kind of... Um, basic rudimentary system um, of points, let's say, or we can assign each point a letter like A, B, C, 
the number of separate relations between these points um, seems to skyrocket. I think it grows exponentially in relation to the number of points added. So let's say we have two points A and B, and let's talk about just the relations between the points themselves. We can identify two separate relations. We have A to B and B to A with two points. But by the time we add three points, A, B, C, the number grows, <laughs> is already starting to go out of control, right? We have A to B, B to A, so that's two. We have six, six relations, let's say, between three points. So the more points you add, the number of relations continues to grow in a pretty basic way to describe mathematically, though. It slips my mind at the moment how to do so precisely, but you get the idea. Now, let's talk about the social in those terms to begin with. If we're talking about the relationships between human beings, discrete human beings, the social sphere as a type of collective cognition is just like what you'd expect from the human brain. You've got all of these separate nerve cells that have all of these interrelationships by virtue of which we infer that things like intelligence and consciousness are possible. So in any, in any event, what I'm talking about, the social is this sort of dimension in which people are you know, mirroring each other and uh, transmitting ideas and so on, and all the interrelationships between human beings outnumber by far the, the number of discrete human individuals. So looking at something massively complex and more complex than um, you'd expect. That's number one. Number two, I have to refer pedantically to something that I studied quite a bit a while ago, and that's Lacanian psychoanalysis. To me, this is the only psychoanalysis worthy of the name, and it's the only psychoanalysis that really achieved a superlative level of intellectual rigor and explanatory power. Um, it's based on the work of someone named Jacques Lacan, who died, I think, in 80 or 81. And he was the only true heavyweight to take up the mantle of psychoanalysis after Freud, really. Anyway, one of the first works that he did before his thought had even fully evolved was on something that he called the mirror stage. Supposing that a human infant was a sort of collection of unrelated drives and sensory data. And supposing that uh, the human infant in the beginning had an experience which is totally fragmentary. The question was, out of that fragmentation, how did something like an I or an identity develop? Well, his answer was that this ensemble of fragments, which had no unity, had a unity conferred upon it through something that he described using a kind of mythic device, and that is the mirror stage. This is uh, almost a parable. The idea is that by seeing your image in the mirror and by identifying with that image as a totality, a totality is conferred upon all of these discrete, fragmentary bits of sense data and bodily drives and so on. Now, this is not to say that in every child's life there's this magic moment where they witness themselves in the mirror, and this alone is what confers cognitive unity. Although I think it is significant the first time a child ever sees itself in the mirror and so on, even in the animal world, you see this, those that are able to uh, perceive something in front of them. Anyway, it's, it's the logical category of a unity being conferred upon total fragmentation. And the main import of that for Lacan and for anyone who can understand it is that at the essence of the human individual is a type of inversion. In what is most interior, and we're talking about the origin of the human person, you find something which is exterior, outside. 
if you have to see an image from outside and identify with that exteriority in order to obtain an interiority, in order to obtain a sort of totality and to become a discrete individual, this implies a sort of radical alienation at the basis of the human person because you have to relate to an exterior, an outside, something alien in order for you to have anything that is in, uh, intrinsically interior or personal. And what you end up with there is essentially a relation, a relation which is already a kind of othering process. You identify with the other in order to be anything at all. Now, this alienation in relationality, because that's really what we're talking about, we're talking about racial relationality in general, that alienation becomes compounded with the entrance of the human being into the symbolic world. For example, language. The fact that there's this signifier in English, I, or that I might have a proper name, and I can identify with this signifier, it's essentially an utterly alien exterior construct, the signifier. It is nothing at all but a virtual point, a mark. And yet, I take that and make it essential to who I am. I identify with it completely. And to the extent that I become a speaking being, someone who can communicate in human language, I totally give myself over to division. There is basically no unity at all in the human person. If I am engaged in self-consciousness, I'm thinking usually in linguistic terms, and some would argue you always are, to the extent that there's any relationality at all in the uh, human brain. The, you know, cognition is supposed to be representational no matter what you do, so on and so forth. And you can write this down to the very nature of the brain biologically, the fact that you're talking about neurons in parallel. There's no one neuron that contains the human person. So what you're talking about is a giant relational system. Well, a relation doesn't exist, in fact. You can't knock on a relation like you would a table, right? And so to the extent that that's true, there is no I that I can knock on. The I is virtual. It's relational. And because it's relational, it's essentially uh, a gap, a gap between nothing and itself. And it's a giant network, a system of these gaps that only have any meaning or any sense in relation to other gaps. So you have this idea, this notion that human beings are fundamentally alienated from themselves. They are that alienation. You can connect this very easily with the social. The first thing that I brought up. Because essentially, by going outside of yourself to have a self at all, this is an adventure into the social. You know, if I observe my mother looking at me as an infant and I uh, take her reaction to be distinct, if, if I somehow equate her face with me and she's looking at me, quote unquote, this I have to go outside of myself to return to myself. And all of these departures and returns in total create who we are. So in fact, there is no us that is not always already social. We're always exiting ourselves to return to ourselves. Now in Lacanian psychoanalysis, because it is psychoanalysis and not just a pure social theory, the idea is that there are all sorts of satisfactions that are um, devised in order to account for this general sense of deprivation and alienation. So this is where the sexual element comes in. You know, the various perversions are um, designed attempts to achieve a satisfaction that will compensate for this fundamental alienation. And it goes on and on and on. The ego itself in Lacanian psychoanalysis, which in this particular concept to me has always been very useful, the ego is not 
as it is in other forms of psychoanalysis and also in Western philosophy, the ego is not this I that's transparent to itself. The ego in Lacanian psychoanalysis is already a cathected object. That is, it is an object of satisfaction. It's a compensation. So our moment-to-moment experience of ourselves as adults is already this contrived, mediated effort to hold on to some sort of enjoyment, satisfaction, in the face of what's really a total deprivation of being. The fact that we have to exit ourselves to become ourselves is an evacuation of being. So you have an ego and you're constantly telling yourself this story that's basically a satisfying one. And of course, when you go into psychoanalysis and uh, because of the unique structure of the relationship to the analyst, you uh, start to expose your quote-unquote unconscious self by way of Freudian slips and uh, you know that sort of thing, then your ego is shaken, your experience of yourself is shaken, and it's a different story. But the point is that even the ego, which is what we regard as ourselves self-evidently, is always already quote-unquote mediated by other things. On the one hand, it's mediated by a desire for this compensatory satisfaction. On the other hand, at a very basic level, it's something that you only achieve by being an exteriority to begin with. You're turned inside out at the origin. That being turned inside out can be lined up with the social in general, quote unquote, so that our experiences of ourselves, even at our own most intimate interiorized moments, are actually already telegraphed to an other. They they are signals to an outsider who's maybe not there, but maybe is the kind of uh, accretion of different people we've encountered that we want to be present for, to have an image of ourselves before. Now, what does all this have to do with the paranormal, the anomalous? The theory, given all of that, that occurred to me is that These experiences of the anomalous are, in effect, attempts to give the human being, for the very first time, experiences of its own. The individual human being only has experience independent of the social in the anomalous. What do we hear all the time in UFO accounts? Someone will say, Well, I was looking at this UFO right overhead. And I turned to my buddy and said, did you see that? Do you see that? All this social validation is fundamental to the experience of the anomalous. But I don't think anyone regards it as fundamental enough. In other words, it's much more fundamental than anyone supposes. Because even when you're by yourself and you see UFO, what is it that you're saying to yourself? Is Is it real? Am I really seeing what I'm seeing? What does that really mean? That's just sort of a covert way of saying, How can I articulate this in a way that's socially possible? Because my experience of my reality is always already socially mediated. I'm always seeing things in terms that are socially amenable. Because that's who I am from the beginning. I'm just a a place in a social scheme. However, I mean, look at at what you you cited about the total failure of, of people to integrate these experiences to any kind of worldview. You see something which on its face ought to stand as a refutation to everything that you think and believe, and yet it has absolutely no implications for you at all. Why is that? Because you're already basically totally invested in the social. And actual experience figures into it very little because it's the social interpretation of that experience which is all that counts. So something phenomenologically can present itself to me and hit me right over the head. But since all interpretation is already social, if I don't have a way to interpret it socially, I don't interpret it at all. I might discuss its mute facts. I might say, well, it was orange, it was round, blah, blah, blah. But then derive nothing else from it. It has no implications. It's not integrated into my view of things because my view is always already social. So when you have all of these discrete accounts of people who are experiencing things, you know, the aliens show up in the middle of the night and so on, 
it seems to me it's almost as if a deposit is being made. These individuals are, for the first time, being given a substance which, for not being integratable into the social, amounts to the only individual experience they've ever had because it's theirs and not someone else's. It's not the social. It's something that cannot be integrated into the social at all. So it's the first substance that they ever achieve. So you can almost picture these uh, crazy aliens running around, or whether it's supernatural, you name it, whatever the instance is. Someone encounters something, they are being given an experience that is independent, and it cannot easily be interpreted. There are some people who do interpret it, and often these interpretations are somewhat culturally mediated. But there, there again, you can say, well, why is the UFO issue restricted to this inane subculture? Well, precisely because the social in general is not capable of handling it. So you have this highly contrived subcultural form or set of forms that uh, alone attempt to account for it. Anyway, the idea, I just thought it was provocative, the idea that these experiences being intentionally given in order yeah. to somehow separate the human being from the social, because we're all just in this hive mind, and our interiority is already a construct of the hive mind, but we think, of course, it's the opposite. It's our own special, unique, hidden thing, because somebody else doesn't know what I'm thinking, therefore there is something to me that's different from them. This is the human wager. But if all of these interior thoughts are already the product of an unconscious calculation and an attempt at satisfaction, for example, for being alienated from self and so on, then in everyday human life, there's nothing that's not already social, except for perhaps these experiences which cannot be integrated into the social. And then that person is like cut off from the tribe. You know, that person will never be fully integrated again. So this might be the beginnings of human individuality, what we're witnessing with the anomalous.